Today we have the recognizing bias session. I am JC and I'm on the learning and development team. So I will be the host for today's call. Candice is um, our diversity and inclusion manager. So she'll be going through some of the content and Josh on our learning and development team will be going through some of the content as well. Before we jump in, get, jump in and get started, I would really appreciate if everyone could either close out Slack or mute Slack just to limit distractions as well as background programs that might be competing for either your bandwidth or your attention. Um, there's some really great content today, so I just wanna make sure that you get as much of it as possible. And also be prepared to collaborate. We will have some breakout sessions, so um, we want you to be able to participate in those as well. So what you can expect out of this session today is we'll go over the definition of unconscious bias, different types of biases, and also how to recognize and avoid when you do have a bias. So getting started, we have a question in Menti. So you can either use this link or go to menti.com and enter the code 997402. This link is also in the agenda. So if you go there, you could just click on it and it will open a tab. I know I just told you to close everything and now I'm telling you to open something. Um, so sorry about that, but this is um, the interactive part of our session. So the question is, when you think of bias, what one word do you think of? And all your answers are completely anonymous, not tied to your name or anything like that. Um, and it will just populate kind of a word cloud here on what your thoughts are. Thank you for adding into this. This is really awesome. Um, a lot of pretty heavy words in here um, and we'll touch on some of these in our session today. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Candice to talk about the content. Hi everyone, thank you so much for taking the time to attend. When we think about bias, there are some automatic things that kind of go into our mind. There's so many kind of understood or heard things. And so basically, what bias is, is basically a prejudice that's in favor of against one thing. It could be a person, it could be a group, but it's that, it's that ability that, you know, you just, just kind of don't go in that direction. It's considered to be very unfair. And there also is another element to it when we think about unconscious bias. So unconscious bias is the space and where is kind of the context clues with it. You unconsciously do it. So it's not, and it's also referred to as implicit biases. So it's that portion of your brain where you kind of just are in autopilot or experiences have formed you to feel a certain way. Um, and you unconsciously kind of treat people and it affects how you treat them and how you engage with them or a person or a group. You're probably thinking, why does this matter? Why does it matter to GitLab? Why does uncovering unconscious bias matter? Um, it matters because it affects the bottom line of all the things that we do here at GitLab, whether that is, you know, the influences on other team members, how we interact with them, whether that be the retention, our talent attraction, um, how we work with the community outside of GitLab, decisions and hiring. And so because of all these things, it's very important that we understand how to recognize bias. I'm going to go through a few common types of bias and give a few examples. I won't spend a lot of time on it so that we can have time to do our breakout sessions. Um, you know, our call has been very close to going over each time. Um, so I want to make sure I allow for that. Um, this list is not exhaustive. So please know that you'll find many other kinds if you do your own research. Um, one of the first ones is very common is affinity bias. This is a bias where you kind of gravitate towards someone who shares similar experiences, interests, um, interests or things, people that look like you. You ever notice when you go off to college or school or if you didn't attend, whatever that might be, you kind of gravitate to the familiar. Um, again, just like any bias, it's something that has grown within us. Ageism bias is a one, it's kind of like the elephant in the room. Um, it's that 
adverse feelings or perception that we have based on age. And people want to automatically assume this is always of, you know, someone that is older, but it doesn't have to be older. It could be the reverse. It could be someone younger. So it's just ages and bias in general where, you know, some people who are individual contributors who are new to the work world may feel like there's a bias against them because they're not experienced yet. And the reverse is felt for someone who may not be technically apt, who's making a pivot in their career, or just maybe is getting to a point where they're in a different place in their career um, as they get older. So ages and bias is a big factor in how we work together as well. Authority bias is not one that's spoken of a lot, but it's one that we really do kind of focus on. It's that tendency to attribute greater authority to someone of authority, um, whether they have it or not. It could be someone of fame, power, positions, and, you know, again, it doesn't mean that they actually have to have it. It's just that we automatically give it to them. Conformity bias is a big piece of what we see a lot in recruiting or team meetings, projects. And it's that basically the transfer of what we look like is peer pressure. So um, if there is a group and we're talking about hiring someone and, you know, one side of the group has a, a definite opinion, this person is really great for this role. Um, whereas in there's a, you know, other group, which is adverse. And so it's someone wants to conform and agree with the majority. So it's that, that way that we tend to agree with the majority, regardless of if we have our own beliefs or not. We just go with the majority. Contrast effect. Um, we think about this one when we think about promoting or demoting someone after a single comparison. I think this is a great one we should pay attention to at all, not just GitLab, but every company. When we think about someone that did the role before or someone you work with before. This is one that shows up a lot because you automatically compare that person. You might not always give them the benefit to say, this person could do better than the last person, this could, person could do just as well, but you automatically compare them because that last person may have left such a great image or impact with you. Um, so the contrast effect bias piece is one that we really need to pay close attention to as we fairly want to judge each other um, in the work that we do here at GitLab. Gender, um, this is of course a common one as well. Um, we tend to prefer one gender over another. That could be whether it's by department, occupation, um, when you're out, uh, family-wise. I mean, it, it, this is a very common one as well. Height. This isn't one that is as much discussed as it is it's uh, sometimes a response have you ever been on the call with someone and you see them here over Zoom and then you see them in person, it's, you kind of say, I've seen your face, but I didn't know you were that tall or I didn't know you were that short. And this could be applied to height and weight as well, but it's the dimensional ability to be able to all of a sudden unconsciously may feel like you're treating someone different once you understand um, how they're built. Um, those things really change sometimes, unfortunately. And lastly, again, this list is not exhaustive, but it's meant to just say some common types, is the perception bias. Um, this is one that is very well known because it's the one that we apply stereotypes to. And it's the assumptions towards certain groups. Um, it's very difficult to be objective at times with this one, just as with any others. Um, this one you may see a lot if you say, for example, Someone may say, let's go to this particular place, but because you've had an experience with that location, you may have somewhat of a bias to not want to do that. And so therefore your response is the same. Or um, if you are talking about a certain issue because you have had past experiences that were maybe negative, um, you don't really want to talk about it or you have an immediate response where you respond in a negative way because in the past, that's the way that it was received. So it may not always be the reality. So the big thing to understand about perception, it is just that. It is perception, it's not always reality. Is this a stereotyping bias? Yes, yes. This is definitely, this is what this is. It's the stereotyping. So it's that part, Sid, where you, again, someone may decide, you know, I'm reacting to what my experiences are, but this may not really be what it is. So the reality could be totally different. Even if we want to use, I hate to give away the breakout session, but if we want to, you know, have responses and how we, you know, write things and issues and, you know, really it's not that particular issue. It's just that your experiences have led you to respond to that in the past. So therefore, again, it may not be the reality. It's just the way you perceive it.
Candace, aren't all of these perception biases of some form or another? They are. Thank you for that call out, Joy. So a lot of what you see in here is perception. Some of it is reality, some of it isn't, but it's all the ability to be able to recognize. And so perception kind of lays that layer on all of those. And when you go through the breakout sessions in a minute, you'll see that a lot of these kind of come together where you might see conformity, you might see um, authority in there, you might see ageism, and some of those kind of layers on top of each other. And that's the thing about bias, is the ability to be able to recognize that there are so many kinds and there's so many terms to be used that at the end of the day, it's all of that experiences that you've had that have formed your biases and who you are. Can I take the next slide? Perfect. Yeah, so we do have another mentee poll question. So if you could go back to that. Um, and again, answers are completely anonymous, but if you could just add what you think you might personally have as um, a bias, whether that's unconscious or, or not. Sorry, the name bias, did we see that one? Oh, that's a good point. I don't, I don't think it's on the slide anymore. Um, that's cool. Oops. Uh, and uh, just to, sorry for the interjection, I was trying to take some notes on the questions that came up and I apologize if I misrepresented them, it was sort of a little after the fact, so if people could scroll down, that would be awesome. <laughs> and update any questions or answers I got wrong. Perfect. Thank you for doing that. Awesome. Thank you everyone for voting. I will pass it back over to Candice. I'll run through these pretty quickly and then Josh will follow. Um, we're going to talk now about tips for recognizing and avoiding bias. Um, it's good to know that understand that we all have biases. When you are born into this world, you haven't had an opportunity to really understand, speak, understand things, you gravitate maybe towards smiles and things that feel positive. As we get older, we really start learning and having those things that come within us, which determine our biases. So it's good to understand we all have them. The part about what you know, we really want to focus on and recognizing is determining what your biases are. Again, the list that was provided today is not exhaustive. We have a tool internally for a page for it, but also there are other tools that are out there. There are other research that's out there to determine and to think about what your biases are. And a big portion of this is when you see it, block it. Um, this is that part where we have in our handbook, you know, to you know, feel empowered to speak up. Feel empowered to speak up to, you know, when you're noticing it in a team environment, when you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. When you notice these things, have a conversation with, our, with your team member and when you recognize it, when you see it, block it. And also be okay with having an opinion different from the group. A lot of what we sometimes see with conformity, as I mentioned earlier, is someone not feeling okay to speak against the group for whatever reason that might be regardless of how strong they feel. So be okay with having a different opinion. Be wary of first impressions. This is a huge one um, in recognizing and avoiding bias because we tend to have a tendency to see someone at face value, whether it be over Zoom and say, oh, that's a nice person, you know, speaking of another bias, that halo effect. They're just so nice and, you know, but you have to be wary of that because that first impression is not the only impression. There's several more encounters with the individual. So don't let that first impression be one that, you know, keeps you on a different path. Be able to understand that. Do research, as I've advised earlier, on stereotypes. Understand what types are out there, whether they be from a global perspective, race, gender, do the research. It's also, you know, if you feel comfortable in a vulnerable state where you can have other conversations with team members, also engage in those conversations. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. When working globally, it's important to understand that your perception of bias may be simply just literally a lack of understanding of cultural differences. Um, as an example, there have been times where someone may perceive someone as being very standoff, where they don't want to engage. And that might just be a cultural thing. And sometimes people are tend to be, you know, fast talker, talkers or wordy. And that might just be a regional thing as well, but in their, in their area. So be wary of cultural differences and understand those. 
And again, not lastly, but this is one of the tips to help is when you're making critical business decisions here at GitLab or anywhere else, you wanna broaden your perspective. And you wanna make sure that you're including others in the decisions that you're making, because this will help ensure that you're not really using your own hidden bias that you may not be outwardly thinking about because it's not seen and you may not recognize it. And I'll turn it over to Josh. Cool. Thanks, Candice. Um, so really quick, you know, we, we talked a lot about managing unconscious bias and, and what that really looks like. I wanted to just introduce you all to the space two model of inclusion. Now, this is a really great way if you find yourself in a situation where you recognize that you are applying unconscious bias, you can use the, the model to really self reflect and create self awareness. And it really starts with, you know, slowing down, you know, being mindful and considered in your response to others. Put yourself in the other person's shoes and be empathetic. I mean, I think empathy is a, is a thread to managing your bias. And then really asking yourself questions to challenge your assumptions. It's, it's, it's also, you know, really important at GitLab to keep a frame of cultural intelligence when you're interacting with others. You know, we work with teams all across the globe. You know, there are cultural nuances that we should all be aware of. And then exemplars, you know, think of counter stereotypical individuals in your life that maybe don't fit the mold of stereotypes. That's something I, I try to do a lot. Um, and then lastly, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, create a plan of action to expand your mind. You know, at the end of the day, managing unconscious bias is all about self-awareness and, and empathy. So next slide there, JC. Yeah, and so, you know, we've taken the, the space two model and, and applied it to a sample scenario that, that may occur or may not at GitLab. But, you know, we, we outlined this to really use as a frame of reference. So when we go to the breakout activities, uh, reflect back on this and, and check it out of how to apply the space two model in an actual un unconscious bias situation. So without further ado, let's go to the breakout activities. All right, so now is the fun part. Uh, we're going to divide everybody up into groups of five. Uh, we'll do this via Zoom. It's not much you have to do on your end. And you will pick one of the four scenarios on the following slide. Talk about it amongst your team. You know, talk about being an ally in the situation, talk about applying the space two model, and then be prepared for somebody on the team to come back and share it as a group for some fun discussion. Okay, I will pass it over to Candice for the debrief. Thank you, thank you. Fingers crossed we can get to everyone. Um, it's been such great discussions in the past that we have gotten close to the wire. So um, that said, um, without further ado, whoever is a spokesperson for group one, I would love to hear a summary of what you discussed and which one you chose. I can go. We didn't pick one, but I'll volunteer. Um, we had, we chose the height bias and we had some good discussion around feelings around height. Um, there were six of us on the call and five of us identified as tall and the other medium. So we were able to go from the tall perspective. Uh, but basically we were talking about it that potentially we may never have even spoken to someone who is shorter in height about what that feels like or if they feel that it's an asset or even like to bring it up because there's a underlying bias or assumption that taller is better. Um, and it was really interesting to talk that through and you can read some of our notes there in group one. Um, Jen also had a really good point about gender identities and heights and as females who are tall, there's often an aspect of um, either being um, called out in high school or then also like when you're in your, further along in your career, you might be taller than your male colleagues and that can feel a little weird sometimes too. So we had some good discussion around that. And Sid mentioned um, he may have because he's tall, there's a, might, he may um, be a CEO or had a leg up in being a CEO for being tall. <laughs> because there's this bias there that in height. Um, and then Haley mentioned um, that she's average in height and doesn't get comments either way. And she thinks there might be a, um, a height 
sorry, a reaction to someone being a different height that runs counter to your expectations. I love that. Thank you, Kristen, for giving us the summary. I saw a lot of, you know, the, the layers starting to show when we think about gender and height. So it's really hard <laughs> to, kind of not, you know, let the, all the biases start blending together. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Group two. Hi, thanks. I'll talk for group two. We took the uh, first scenario, scenario A, about the perception bias. Um, we had kind of noted that we, we may have seen this play out recently a little bit in some of the endpoint management conversations where some of the comments got a little bit maybe heated. Um, we, we kind of felt that the, the space to framework could definitely be applied in order to kind of uh, allow you to combat the perception bias. Uh, specifically, I think it allows you to find a time to assume positive intent and make sure that everyone's on the same page, we're all on the same team, all going in the same direction. Um, there, there's also some conversation around the medium that you choose to have those conversations. So it's a lot uh, easier to not assume positive intent when you're reading a text message. And if things are, aren't going well in, in issue comments, for example, uh, switching to a synchronous Zoom call might be a good way to resolve something like that nine out of 10 times. Um, and then we also had a little bit of a discussion around um, maybe doing something a little bit louder. Stella pointed out that if you if you drew someone back to the handbook maybe and said, hey, short toes is kind of something that's really important. Uh, but then we had a, a more conversation about the other side of that, seeing people kind of weaponize the handbook in certain situations where they're using it to defend uh, their, their attitude or their, uh, their comments as well. So uh, yeah, it's important to provide the context and be open to layered conversations and one-on-one -on -one conversations in order to uh, overcome that. Thank you for that, Ricky. I think the biggest piece is, you know, using the handbook um, as well as a weapon to defend what you're saying. But, you know, at the end of the day, as long as we have, uh, we're able to recognize what our biases are and we're all doing the efforts and the work to really combat that, I think that's the important thing. And so thank you so much for summarizing that. Group three. So we touched on uh, both kind of the unconscious bias based on a title in an organization and the height bias. So we talked about how at times you can have a bias based on how you're t how you're supposed to be targeting somebody if they're a CEO, CTO, CRO, you may have preconceived notions about that person and how they're going to be receptive to you or not receptive to you just based on their title alone without giving them a fair shake as a person. We also touched on the height bias. Moses had shared that he had a coworker who was seven feet tall and every meeting that he went into, it was just it was always commented on and people would say, wow, you know, you're seven feet. And he would jokingly say he's six foot 11. But we talked about how you should really try to put yourself being empathetic and putting yourself in their shoes to think how many times has he probably heard the same tired jokes? How many times has he probably heard? How's the weather up there? And, you know, just being empathetic and, and thinking that that's probably be the best way to form a relationship with somebody is to call out something that number one, they can't help. I mean, they were just blessed with it or cursed with it at birth. And number two, they probably heard every joke you have a million times in the past. I gave an example on my height bias that I've seen. I, I worked for a VP who was probably five foot four. I'm five nine with heels. I can be six feet tall. And every time I'd see him, he would make a comment on it. Sometimes it was joking and it was oftentimes in front of a lot of other people. And it really wasn't something that, again, that you, you need to hear again and again. I, I was made fun of it when I for it when I was younger and growing up, and um, now it doesn't bother me. But back then, in, in a group of people, it can be perceived as being bullying. So mm -hmm. again, we just came back to really trying to maintain empathy and put yourself in somebody else's shoes, even just if they are high heels. One thing I wanted to elaborate on, on that from a uh, being a Sal and being in the sales role, that title bias, not only because we, we have to develop personas, we have to develop, you know, strategies of who to talk to into an organization. So you're often trying to, you just have these perceptions of title you're naturally going into, right? And so um, 
you know, you need to kind of step back and you, you talked about Candace about having not only a first percent, um, first interaction, but kind of multiple to kind of validate that. But even on the flip side, as being a salesperson, people have perceptions of me as a sales individual that I just want something from them. Or even if you change the title from sales to partnerships, people view you differently with partnership as being more collaborative and engagement and looking at the longer term value of a partnership than sales, right? I go in and I send Sid an email who's a CEO who's very busy and it's Moses Madero's the sales person. He's probably, I'm not saying you said specifically, but a CEO may say, I've got so many things going on. Like I, I'm, you know, may push that aside because it's sales, right? So it's, it's, you see both sides of it and it's, it's really interesting. It stood out to me, Candace, when you said that because I'd never heard title bias like that. So. Mm -hmm. That happens. It happens quite a bit. And I'm so glad that, you know, you were able to clue into that and use that. Um, I don't want to hold the time, but I'm interested just if, if you could elaborate for just one quick second. Do you feel like hype plays a role in success in sales? Um, since that was the subject, do you think that plays a role in success? Now that we're remote, we're a remote company, not all companies are, but do you think that plays a role in it? I actually uh, saw an article. Oh, oh, Moses, I was just going to say really no, quickly, no, either Fortune or, or Finance, one of those magazines that talked about uh, CEOs and the average height. And the average height of most CEOs, of most male CEOs, is over six feet tall. I can find it and, and try to share the link, but it was interesting. We were talking about that in our group as well. And if you look at the average height of U.S. presidents, yes. um, they're all very tall as well. And so we kind of equate height with success. Not that you're not super smart, Sid, but. <laughs> no, but it's, uh, we it's discussed true. that as well. That is, it's a, it's a humbling thought that probably some of the success is just due to your height, not due to your intelligence or effort or other things, but just pure height. And that's, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the statistics show a very, very clear correlation there. Yes. So thank you all for that. Group four. Sure, I'll speak up for that. Uh, to some quick notes, we had the ageism one. Um, and, you know, this uh, quick reactions to it from various people on the team was ask the team of, it, since this was a question directly that the younger individual saying, would they like to work on it, that the team could turn that around and say, well, is there anybody else who'd like to work on it and give the team a chance to speak up? Another note was that sometimes we can feel like in the pressure of a meeting that the, we use the bias as a shortcut of, oh, that seems like a quick solution to this problem and everybody just agrees to it. So making sure we're aware that we're not just trying to shortcut and find a quick solution to a problem. Um, and then there was a little bit of, depending on the temperature of the team, if this is a team that's worked together for a long time and you feel like you've got a reasonable level of candor or cohesion, I think it's okay to directly challenge that you know, why did you ask that question? Do you think we're biasing towards that younger person for a reason? If it's a team that's maybe not worked together as much, maybe that's a better place to take that one-to-one -one when you notice that bias and address it um, directly and give feedback um, after the fact. So I think there's a little bit of knowledge of your team and how you work together, depending on whether or not you could directly challenge why are we asking that question. And then our last point was also just for team retros and other things, record that decision. Maybe not a decision that we were picking the youngest person, but if you record that decision, we can look back on our pattern of decisions and see if we were continuing to exhibit that bias. And okay. in order to try to respect the other teams, I'm gonna cut it there. <laughs> oh no, I love that. Thank you for the suggestion. That's actually something we could leverage. Group five. Hi, yeah, we took scenario C, the affinity bias, which is the hiring um, a manager saying this person reminded them of themselves at that point in the career, and so they really liked them. And um, so a couple people chose this because they had seen it in other jobs recently, um, not here at GitLab, but had seen it come up in their careers or um, saw a tendency for this kind of thing. And Matt talked about the fact that it's you know it's often a, a cult used or, or masked with the idea of well they fit better in the culture. Um, and we talked about the fact that uh, Sid is often seen talking about the fact that we're not about cultures, we're about our values. And so he talked about a better thing to do is to align to a value rather than to a perceived culture of a team or an organization or group. And being able to go back to, to values, as Matt said, you know, can, can they have results? Because that's what our team needs most. Um, and being able to, to change the fit. Um, 
and we talked about um, that coming up. Cindy also talked about a way to work with it is to um, to slow everything down and ask a lot of questions. So it may be that that person really is the best fit, um, but if somebody says something like that, it's a good time to pull back, slow down and ask some questions about, are they really a good fit for the values of the things we're hiring for? Or are we leaning into some affinity bias in liking them? So that's what we came up with. I love that. The affinity piece really stands out on that one. Thank you so much, Joyce. Group six. Uh, so group six, we also did the height bias. So just to fill in a little color for what has already been talked about. One aspect we discussed was we may not possess that bias, but the other individual might feel defensive or might feel others have. And I think it was brought up earlier uh, by the, the woman who talked about being tall and being um, teased about that. So if someone were to make a comment, even though they don't have that bias, they might feel, as, they may feel defensive. So it's important that we control our emotions about that. Let's not comment to that. Let's be empathetic that they may have a feeling about that. And, um, and one individual talked about um, feeling in some situations where they were kind of surrounded by a bunch of tall people and it just was a little intimidating. So let's be empathetic and think about can we make the communication style uh, more um, empathetic and say, hey, you want to go grab a seat and talk about this? Or you know, just be conscious that that delta might have a negative impact on the other person. I like that. And those are things that we can actually use uh, to move towards our handbook. Thank you for that. Group seven. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, I got nominated again to do the reading for this group. It seems like a pattern for me. <laughs> um, so we had an interesting discussion. We were originally sort of trying to work out how best to address it. We went to this phase two model um, and sort of in the context of commenting uh, scenario A, excuse me, I should have said that, um, which is the perception bias. Um, in the context of slowing down, we thought it would be helpful to go back in an issue where there's comments and sort of read through um, and take a, take a look at actually what's being said and try and figure out in terms of perspectives what, what was being uh, communicated and where the conflict came up. Um, uh, we felt like it was worthwhile considering, particularly in written form, that um, it, it can be difficult to understand people's intent. It can be hard to understand some cultural backgrounds of, of people and how they might impact their communication styles and how they receive certain communication. Um, and sort of identifying uh, ways we might consider those things in, in being empathetic towards that person um, in responding to them. Um, I think someone said earlier that uh, you know asking a lot of questions is really helpful. I, that's something I'm just interjecting here because that was really I thought that was a really good point. Um, and we kind of got to a point where we we're getting a two-minute warning, and we were probably like 60 or 70 70 percent through our discussion. So uh, I hope I did our discussion justice, everybody. You did great. Thanks so much, Daniel. Thank, thanks for that. And last group. Well, actually, we have a month, well, group eight and group nine to follow. So um, speaking for group eight, we chose the height, bi height bias as well. It seems to be a fairly popular one, which is interesting. Um, I shared a, an anecdote from our Cape Town Summit a couple of years ago now where I met a, a leader at GitLab I had worked with probably about nine months, met them in person for the first time, and they were far shorter than I, than I would have guessed, um, probably like over a foot in height difference. And I don't think I had noticed that because you know, we were always eye to eye on webcams working remote. Um, and later at the happy hour, I found myself kind of a four or five person group with them. And I noticed that everybody else was about six feet tall and we were all talking just kind of like eye to eye. And this person was literally under the radar, if that makes sense. Um, and um, I also noticed that that person was kind of like, topics would come up that I happened to know they were an expert in and they weren't getting heard and they weren't even offering uh, anecdotes or, or threads on that same topic. And so there may have been some of that kind of self-censorship sort of thing going on. And some of uh, my group mates shared anecdotes about people they had known that were on the shorter side of past companies choosing a diminutive nickname for themselves or being self-effacing or self-conscious of that thing. So there, is, there, there does seem to be that, um, that self-fulfilling prospect uh, or, or rather prophecy aspect of it. Um, so I tried to be an ally. So I, I tried to make sure I was conscious of uh, looking for me downward at that person. Um, when they, you know, every once in a while there's a break in the conversation, people throw little ideas and comments, and sometimes it's the loudest person or the tallest person gets heard. This person's ideas weren't getting heard, so I try to like, 
ask them to repeat it so that they could say it again. And sometimes that would help a little bit. Um, and I tried some other, other sort of like kind of ally type techniques there because I wanted that person to get heard. Um, that was a very conscious process for me, but it made me aware that there's probably an extremely powerful unconscious bias to height. Um, and Jessica mentioned presidents earlier. Um, I believe the statistic is we've actually elected the taller candidate every single year, every, every election year since 1960 when we started televising the debates, uh, Nixon Kennedy, which is not a great way to pick leaders. So I think there's really something to that. Um, but the positive aspect was that as a remote company, um, being eye to eye on webcams, it's kind of the great leveler and it probably makes us probably more immune to this than the, than the average company does in a, in a really interesting way. So uh, that makes me sort of, you know, um, hopeful. Thank you so much for that. And I know that we have two minutes left and so Sid, my apologies for trying to make this a speedy meeting, but um, if, if we could have one of the two groups, um, nine and 10 to speak up, we might not, we don't obviously have time for Q&A, but just have a quick summary of what you discussed. Yeah, uh, in group nine, we took the affinity bias and um, basically we talked a lot about bringing it back to the facts. So when the hiring manager says, oh, they remind me of myself back then, like, be like, yeah, that's great, but what qualifications, what quantitative qualifications do they have that what, that they're going to bring to the team? And then also like bring maybe bringing up the fact like, well, you know, what are some things we should look out for? Like maybe you were a little impetuous back then, or maybe you were um, had some other uh, faults that might not be good for this role at this time. Uh, and then also gauging the hiring manager, what type of person they are, and the, what is the best way to approach them on their bias, saying um, and letting them know so that they can further grow uh, from this experience. Thank you so much. And lastly, group 10, and JC's gonna drop in the invite, um, the link for you all to take um, a survey. So um, I appreciate that. And the last group. We chose the height bias simply because the morning groups hadn't really chosen it, so we're like, hey, we'll tackle it. Um, but we actually realized that this is somewhat of a GitLab-focused bias because of the fact uh, that you don't, it's a unique bias to GitLab because you don't necessarily work with people until you, or you don't meet people until you are in person with them. For a typical company, you meet them right away. So you can see our, our reviews right there. Thank you so much. Sorry for the rush. We have really had a great full discussion. Um, please take the evaluation when you have an opportunity and look forward to seeing you all on Zoom. Have a great afternoon. Evening. Thanks for the training. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.